So I am so pleased to continue this conversation um, with my guest, Walter Makish, who is the Director of Civilian Operations at Cisco. And I just want to thank our underwriter, Cisco, um, for, for, you know, partnering with us on this on this session. So Walter, before we dive in, can you just tell us a little bit more about yourself and your role at Cisco? Yes, Walter Makish, uh, nice to Nice to be here. Uh, my role at Cisco, I will say, changed quite significantly when, <laughs> a couple a couple months ago. I, at before COVID, um, it was uh, to manage, of course, the uh, the 300 or so folks that that we have basically interacting with our government customers, specifically in the civilian market. Um, post the pandemic, it became uh, I was one of many folks, one of 300, just trying to help solve these problems when it comes to response to COVID when it comes to um, the way that our government customers were, uh, were kind of rotating. It, it, it was amazing to see uh, just how quickly the government was able to respond. And for us, it was important in terms of the role that we were playing uh, to have everybody basically shoulder to shoulder, ensuring that we were handling uh, that we were handling what was coming to us um, as well as possible. I, I have not worked so many uh, weekends, nights and, and others um, on just purely solving kind of technology problems, process problems, and just trying to help uh, figure out how, how we respond to this, which, as I said, I just commend the government in terms of the way that it, it has been responded to. You've, you've definitely talked about the speed. I, I recall you saying that, you know, things that looked like they might have taken years or months took, you know, days and weeks. And so it, it just was so accelerated around this pace. Um, so we just heard a lot of great stories about, you know, where the government is accelerating its IT modernization. And I want to focus on citizen services. So the last session we heard some, you know, amazing things like a thousand percent increase in, in the, at the VA in things like telehealth visits, but that can tax the system. So how can agencies leverage IT modernization to transform the services that they provide to citizens, especially in such a critical time? So as it, as it relates to those services, I think the three most important things are security, ease of access, and ease of use, right? As it, as it just relates to, relates to the way that our citizens are planning on interacting with, uh, with, with the government here moving forward. Um, in terms of remote capabilities, that couldn't be more important. Um, for us, when we look at modernization, right? Modernization is not necessarily new. It's not brought on by the pandemic. Modernization is a response in a lot of ways to the aging infrastructure that is um, currently facing, you know, our government has been now for several years. For us, we like to look at what are those mission outcomes that our customers are moving towards? What do they need to ensure that they're enabling in the next three to five years? And then we look at building a transformational roadmap so that the investments that are being made from a modernization perspective and an IT debt perspective really pave the way for enabling those mission outcomes. We call that the transformational roadmap. I've done that with a num number of our customers, and those roadmaps have been accelerated as a res as a result of the pandemic. That's great. And so, so typically, when you're starting an engagement, you start with the mission. Always, and it's mission outcomes, and it's looking three to five years out, because as you're as you're making these, you know, multi million and even billion dollars investments, it's just so important that it's not replacing like for like. Alan talked about uh, SD WAN and some of the new te technologies that are coming out from from a WAN perspective that that will allow the government to, to leapfrog their commercial brethren in, in many cases. Um, but it's very important that we don't just look at, at essentially replacing device by device and keeping some of the same technology that's been in place for a long time. We need to be looking towards the future, looking towards those mission outcomes and be designing architectures and infrastructure uh, with that in mind. Well, I mean, on the commercial technology, com government has traditionally been slower than the private sector in adopting, adopting uh, commercial technology as a service. But we're really starting to see that change. So um, where do you see the biggest leap in government's use of tech as a service? Um, without a doubt, we have, we have a lot to thank GSA for and, and the team Alan spoke to earlier. I mean, EIS is purpose built for accelerating as a service. Um, so that's just in, incredibly helpful, I think, in, in the conversations we're having directly with those agencies and departments. They've all been complimentary in terms of thank, in terms of thanking GSA for building a vehicle. Um, to that end, so uh, that's been extremely critical. Now, when you look at moving towards cloud and as a service technologies, it's important to do the due diligence um, on the providers, right? So from a reliability perspective, truly understanding that HA architecture, the HA posture that's out there, the high availability, 
and what happens if something if there is kind of a breakdown you know what's the level of expectation with respect to service the the next is security right certifications are certainly one thing but they're table stakes essentially if you don't truly understand the security that's being um, provided by those as a service providers um, or being utilized as, by those as a service providers you can uh, sometimes you know the certifications just aren't aren't necessarily enough uh, and sometimes there are specific asks that we as an as a service provider have been asked with respect to building security on certain platforms and we've done that in order to make sure that we understand the unique you know security challenges facing some of our customers um, and then lastly it's weighing that performance and capability improvement against cost right so uh, there can be a very cheap as a service solution um, and sometimes that fits the bill but in some cases if you really look at the performance and the capability improvements that you're trying to make uh, as a result of moving to as a service the ultimate long-term total cost of ownership uh, is, is a much different story than just what is that kind of initial capital investment. Yeah, I mean, we're certainly in an unprecedented time and it's highlighted the need for resilience across an organization. Um, in your mind, what are the biggest lessons that you've heard from government agencies around building a resilient IT infrastructure? I, I would say the number one lesson is uh, is to not is to not necessarily wait for that pandemic, right? I mean, you yeah. know, uh, <laughs> Mr. Cusack talked about the fact that, you know, some of these uh, technologies need we need to be able to scale them down right I mean, the the VA in that increased capacity uh, was something that was a very very difficult technical problem to solve and it, it was solved within a weekend right in terms of doubling up on that capacity if, if anybody out there hasn't seen kind of the write-ups that have been done that are sitting on the on the VA website you know I beg you to go look at that because it was a lot that went into that in a very very short time and the I mean, the, an organization that size to be able to double capacity was was just absolutely mind blowing. Um, it was also, you know, again, ensuring that we were uh, in constant communication with OMB, with uh, Mr. Hill and his team, and recognizing what they were telling agencies, how they were guiding agencies um, in terms of that resilience and how to Im improve that resilience over this period of time. Uh, so acting collectively in terms of the vendor community, the customers, the decisions they were making, as well as OMB and GSA with the guidance that they were providing, you know, that was extremely important. And I, and I think we managed to do that in terms of staying coordinated um, with each one of those different players, as opposed to building resilience at a point in time or, you know, basically just in each unique situation to solve that one unique problem. Um, you know, we're starting to see the ease of telework guidance, certainly, um, and I think that was a was a necessity, as you heard, um, certainly for competitiveness, even for jobs. But as we head back into the office, I mean, looking forward, I think that leaders are going to need to plan for a post-COVID kind of hybrid workforce situation, you know, where you're both mm -hmm. and you're in the office. Um, but we you know work requires a fast network. It requires strong application performance and good collaboration tools like like WebEx, which I'm just going to you know give a shout out to you all. The platform that you're actually viewing right now is 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 actually your WebEx platform. So no matter where they are, they need those tools. So what does this look like, and how can government leaders start planning for that in the future? Which is you know just basically a new work, a new way we work. It is. It is. So as, as you evaluate those tools today, I mean, in, in, just in, in staying with WebEx, right? I mean, it's just important to understand from a mission perspective how you need those tools to operate and what you need those tools to do. So for us, I mean, WebEx, we've always focused on, on essentially scale, right? The feature set, the reliability, the security, um, and each one of those pieces. And that that's really, um, for, for our customers, what they love about WebEx and why they continue to use it. Um, if you look at more of the coming back, as you mentioned, and that kind of hybrid workforce that we're going to be that we're going to have for a long time to come. Uh, we at Cisco, when we do briefings, we bring customers out to San Jose, right, for our executive briefing center. And one of the things, one of the most popular things for customers to do, and this is pre pandemic, was to actually say, Cisco, how are you designing your offices and how are you using your own kind of collaboration te technologies and, and so on and so forth. It's one of my favorite sessions and one of the most impactful for us every time we, we get out there to that headquarters campus. If you have the opportunity to do that when we're flying, we'd love to we'd love to host you. But I take uh, you up. now <laughs> now, you know, what we're being told in terms of, you know, being one of the, the benchmarkers in this in that aspect of the industry, uh, 
the way that Cisco is rotating is by really leveraging some of the tools that are actually already out there. So a tool like proximity. So with proximity, and this is now the mandate, right? When you walk into a Cisco office, you cannot actually put your hands on any of the, any of the equipment that's actually in a conference room. So anything to make the video technology work, anything to make, you know, any of those systems that are in there kind of get ready for that to host and do that collaboration. Proximity allows you to actually just use your handheld device and essentially operate every single system, whether it's WebEx, whether it's the telepresence, the video, your desktop, every single device can be used with your phone and it and the devices all know that you're there as soon as you walk into the room. So again, this proximity, it's a really neat tool and we are gonna be relying on that heavily as we, as we bring that hybrid workforce back to work. That's great, I mean, that's great. Um, certainly there's been tension in, in, in this time between security and ease of use. You had a lot of people who were moving out and didn't have IT systems and had to, you know, go to, to go to their homes to work. So we've seen, you know, that, that tension between security and ease of use on display for a while now. Uh, and I think the government has really needed to grapple with that balance head on during this maximum telework period. So looking forward and moving into more of a hybrid work situation, what role is IT modernization going to play in enabling a secure but flexible workforce? So I, I think this is where zero trust networks uh, are, are so incredibly timely. Um, it, it, you know, we are uh, we're, we're actually the largest security provider um, in the world in the industry. And so uh, for Cisco, when we look at zero trust architecture, what, what we see is that you need a tool that builds on itself, right? Not something that is, a, a, you know, a bolt on. You need a tool that essentially can do various elements of the, the zero trust architecture um, right out of the box, right? So um, Forrester does a, a, a great study on, on zero trust architecture and the various, um, various vendors out there and kind of how they're approaching it. And again, for us, it's that when we look at routers, switches, um, every aspect of your security footprint, and of course, firewalls and, and so on, security needs to be a part of the architecture itself, not something that is bolted on at the last minute, or, or I shouldn't say the last minute, but just after the fact, um, because those tools just inherently aren't going to work as well together. Right. Um, and, and certainly just switching over to innovation, you know, over the past few months, there's been a lot of innovation as agencies have been forced to adapt quickly. Um, so as an important part of IT modernization, how can these agencies continue to innovate in the future? So innovation has always just got to be, you've got to keep the mission in mind, right? And those mission outcomes kind of where we started this conversation. So uh, looking three to five years out, what innovation is necessary to create those outcomes? Our best actually opportunities to interface with customers is when we get them together directly with the people that we have in San Jose and other places that are actually designing the products and the, the products so that they can ensure that the innovation that our government customers and other customers are looking for um, is always in the back of their mind as they're designing projects um, or designing products, excuse me. Uh, from my perspective, if I look at where is the most innovation going to come from, um, AI and ML is clearly a focus. So DOD has had that as a focus now for, for some time. Civilian, we're obviously making enormous leaps and, and bounds to, to kind of catch up to some extent, but also to understand how those outcomes that we're looking for are going to be enabled by AI and ML. And 5G, of course, as everybody says, is, is going to really propel that forward in terms of our capability and the ability to use um, and set up those tools for AI. I mean, it, it really is an unprecedented time between, you know, 5G and AI. And, and, and really, you know, we have EIS and we have, you know, new guidance from the TIC 3.0. It's, it's really a unique time. And I, I, I've seen, I've been doing this now for more than 20 years, and it just feels like things are really propelling faster than ever now, which is a great thing. Um, to close, I'd love to get your boldest prediction for the future of IT modernization. So as our audience looks towards what is next, what absolutely must be on their radar in your mind? So the, the boldest prediction uh, that I can make, it, that's, a, that's a tough one with the, uh, with the word boldest, because I'm not going to be the only person saying this. But I would tell you that the boldest prediction uh, out there is that when we think about the technologies that we put in place to respond to this pandemic, those technologies are going to be a big part of the way that we do business moving forward. So, you know, the, the remote access, the remote collaboration tools, um, all of those elements are, are not going to be here today, gone tomorrow, but are going to be uh, really at the heart of the way that we design architecture systems and the like moving forward. 
it's, it's going to have to be also to keep the, you know, one of the things we always talk about in conjunction with technology is workforce. You can't, in order to be competitive, we're going to have to have flexible tools. I mean, to, 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 to stay competitive in the, in the, in the workforce um, for the federal government. Exactly. I, I mean, again, you know, circle back to one of the things that, that I said, I, I just have never been prouder of, yeah. you know, our organization here at Cisco, um, but then in addition, our, you know, our, our country and the way that we've responded. Certainly there, there's, you know, been highs and lows and everybody's got, got opinions, but the reality is that the way that our government responded in terms of building these systems, the continuation of citizen services and being able to provide those citizen services, if you had asked me before the pandemic, if you had asked me six months ago, if we would have been able to continue to provide those services the way that we have, um, it, it would have it would have been challenging, right, to really think that we could have accomplished what we have in the last you know three to six months. It's been it's been absolutely unbelievable to to watch and to be a part of. Um, and I just uh, I, I thank the folks on this call, and I and I thank the folks that uh, that aren't that are that were part of the. Part of the response and, and part of the solution. It's really an amazing story, and and thank you so much, and thanks to Cisco uh, for everything that you do, and also just for thank you for for sponsoring our session today. And it really is a lot of great information to get out to everybody. And I just thank you, Walter, for being my guest today. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy it. <laughs>